There was never a sound beside the wood but one. And that was my long sight whispering to the ground. What was it, it whispered? I knew not well myself. Perhaps it was something about the heat of the sun. Something, perhaps, about the lack of sound. And that was why it whispered and did not speak. It was no dream of that gift of idle hours, or easy gold the hand of Phi or Elf. Anything more than truth would have seemed too weak to the earnest love that laid the swale in rows, not without feeble-pointed spikes of flowers and a scared bright green snake. The fact is, the sweetest dream labor knows, my long sight whispered and left the hay to make. Hi, I'm Ranger Chuck Arning with the National Park Service here in the John H. Chafee Blackstone River Valley National Heritage Corridor. And it's haying season here in New England. It's early June, and the folks in the New England farming community have come here to Waters Farm in Sutton, Massachusetts to lend a hand. We're here at this 1757 farmhouse, uh, the legacy of Dorothea Waters Marne, who gave it to the town of Sutton. And this is managed and operated by the volunteers of the Waters Farm Preservation. Now these folks are dedicated to preserving the memory and our understanding of New England farming traditions and the farm community. And through their events and festivals, we get a real sense of place and time and community. So I'll tell you what, why don't you join us if we watch over a century and a half of farm equipment and that New England farm community as they swing into action as we get down to that very serious business of cutting hay. To me, hay outdoors was the best part of farming. Putting it in the barn on, and pushing it back on a rainy day was not my idea of being a, a nice farm job. First off, it's usually the uh, first week in June, the hay is ready to be cut, but the, the ground is too wet. If you own horses, you can get out there. But if you had a tractor in today's tractor, you better wait till the end of June. And that's because that's when your grass was really topped off, that you get the full seed then, and it's the best, best time to cut. You know, this thing we call work, farm work, is really quite simple. You start with a determined brow, a body well-toned by many hours in fields such as these, a strong will, and yes, a tool. Simple, but efficient by design, such as this wooden pitchfork, designed to help the farmer pitch his hay and get it into the barn. And another tool, a scythe. The scythe meant for cutting hay. It's an art, like anything else. You just don't pick up a scythe and, and stop mowing. Because if you do, if you haven't got it set right, you mow, you stick it in the ground, or you're leaving grass high, or you don't mow this way. A lot of people, they mow with a action coming on this way. And what you have, you have a field that's wavy, and you're losing an awful lot of crops, which isn't good. You should have a, you should have a nice, try to cut it as close to the ground as you can. And also, when you're through mowing, your rows should be, there should be no grass here. Your rows should be all in a straight line, and all the heads of the grass, is like you see here, all pointing in one direction. As you can see, yep. back in here, this is all, all the heads are all pointing in one direction. And this is the way it should be. And by the way, this is not supposed to be here. This is my, this is my switchel. And every once in a while, you need to take a drink, which I'm gonna do right now. 
Ernie, what's this, made in that sport though? Anyway? Well, it's a concoction of water, molasses, ginger, vinegar, brown sugar, and a, just a touch of lemon juice. And what it does, it keeps your electrolytes up, it keeps you from getting cotton mouth, which, it, which uh, you know, you'd get dry. And uh, it keeps you, uh, it just keeps you, keeps you going, keeps you from sweating too much. But more than, light, more than anything else, it keeps your electrolytes up in your body so you can keep going underneath the hot sun. And always, as you see all these gentlemen here today, they all got broad brim hats, which is very essential for being out in the sun. It keeps your uh, sun away from your eyes and uh, also for, for cancer too. You shouldn't, and white shirt deflects the sun, try to keep you as cool as you can. Ernie. This hand cutting, it looks like hard work. Is there a certain rhythm you develop to ease the body? Uh, yeah, uh, pretty much a lifetime of doing it. And with these uh, American snaths, this is a snath, this is the scythe. This one here is the American uh, scythe. I chose to use this one today because it's heavier cutting. With the American snath, as you notice, it's curved, it's to the curvature of your body. So when you, when you move around, this here follows right around the contour of your body. And you set your handles where it's more comfortable to you. And also, when your blade, you should be standing pretty much straight up, maybe a little bit forward, but not much. Your blade, your, your scythe should be on the ground, not not flat like that, but just up, just a little bit. And because uh, if you're down, you're going to have a tendency of digging in. If you're up too high, it's not going to cut good. It's going to slide up. So you want it just about, just about where I got it right there. And to do that, you have adjustments in the back. You have three holes here where you can, you take it off from this. I'll take it off for you. I just, that comes right apart. I just turn that out. That comes right off. Now, you have three holes here. I've been running it down into that bottom hole for quite a bit. As you can see, the worn, one part here. So that just slips in, and you have a little tab right here that hooks in here. You slide it down, you put it in there, and you just hold it in there, tighten this up. We wouldn't want to tighten it too much because we'll crack this here. This holds a scythe, so it's strong. These handles here, you'll probably notice I have leather on them. The reason why I have leather on them through years of use, these here, the snaps got worn with these serrations, there's serrations in these holders that hold it tight to the snap. These here over time got worn out. So to take up on them, what I did, I took an old piece of leather, I slipped it in there, now I'm able to tighten it down. When you tighten these down, these are, these are uh, left hand tread. So when you, when you mowing, you always have a tendency of keeping them tight all the time. If they were if they were right hand treads, you'd be always loose all the time. So as you're mowing, you always have a tendency of keeping them tight all the time. Now Ernie, you got about five gentlemen with you cutting this field today. How long would it take you using this technology, the old technology, to cut a field like this? Well, Chuck, we get a pretty good sized field here, but my judgment would be where we started off at the beginning, down to probably about that. Uh, pile of wood down here in this area here uh, it would take us probably about uh, three three and a half hours to do it but one thing you got to realize is that this stuff is very heavy cuts hard it's going to take a little bit longer uh, there's no clover in here so to speak very little clover and uh, your light grass your finer grass slices easier because you don't have uh, you don't have the stems 
uh, the stalks like you do in clover. You just have stems and uh, it slices, uh, it cuts very easy. Now, I shouldn't say cut. My first word was right, slice, because when you mow with this, we're not cutting, we're not mowing, we're slicing. It's a slicing action. Uh, it takes probably, it takes on the average at 10,000 swaths per man per acre to cut down an acre. Uh, but it's gonna, as I say, this is gonna take us a little, just a little bit harder cutting. Also, you wanna try to get it as close to the ground as you can because every blade of grass uh, back years ago meant the survival ship of a, a sheep, a calf, pony, horse, cow, whatever. Every blade of grass uh, was very important to your welfare of the animals. That's why after, when you pick up the hay, we go along with a, a hand rake and probably a dump rake, horse dump rake, to pick up what we call scattering. And uh, you'd be surprised what you can get out of scattering. You get quite a bit. And as I say, it's probably enough to feed uh, one or two sheep throughout the winter, which ordinarily would be get left out in the field. My grandfather King, who I never saw without a vest on, even on the hottest day, would take these big bow rakes. They're, they're about uh, four feet wide, and uh, the fingers on them are probably six to eight inches long. And the side men would go down in the wetlands where you couldn't run the mowing machines or hot, put the horses in, and they'd mow the grass, and grandfather was down there retrieving every blade of grass that was cut, you know. And it was, hey, if you didn't have uh, enough hay to feed your animals through the winter, you had to buy it. And so the smart thing was to have it. fifties we didn't have a, uh, a hand a horse rake or anything like that so again out come the family pull all mother daughters kids and everybody yeah. get out into the field and they had the hand rake which you have examples of it being Little done here yep. and uh, we raked the hay into 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 a little row or depending on how much how long the strands of the hay were and then you made them into haycocks New England farmers prided themselves on their ability to make do with what they had. From the very earliest days of the colony, farmers always had oxen. They were plentiful, easily trained, and when cold weather drew close, they could be slaughtered for the family's winter meat or shipped to the West Indies as barreled salt beef for money. The Blackstone Valley, like most of New England, tended to produce a modest-sized hardy will and oxen that were the best design for pulling loads and fattening in three quarters. You know, in the early
early days oh. uh, here, oh. we used to have one man up oh. there. And you had oh. a team that didn't want to go anywhere because oh. they'd been going all day anyway. And they were oh. broke. In fact, a lot of them, you just speak to them and they'd step up to the next haycock. They, they get into a routine. But you had the boy. Here goes uh, the boys again. One or two boys up there tramping hay. The ox wagon was only a six-foot bed. You know, a two-wheel cart. And then you, and that, that had its limits, of course, and then you proceeded into the horse world, and then, which started to really develop in New England around, right after the Civil War. Horses were around, but th then they changed. The horse is much quicker, he has a bigger set of lungs, he, uh, he burns himself out like a man, but he, he'll do a quicker job. And when the horses came aboard, you went from the biggest ox wagon I've seen, uh, we have one, and it's an eight-foot bed. That was a four-wheel wagon, but the horse wagon was 12 foot, so and sometimes 14, but most of them were 12. And that New England farmer prided himself on his well-trained yoke of oxen. And they needed to be well-trained, for often it was with youngsters and the women who would work with them in the field. person that I know of to answer that is our good friend Bud Gurney, President of Waters Farm Preservation. And we're here in the Darling Barn, and, and Bud, technology, the farmer had to deal with that all the time as people found new ways to make things more efficient. But it must have been hard on that local farmer to, to deal with all those changes. Well, of course it was. It was, it was hard in the fact that uh, money played a big part of it. How much money have you got to improve yourself? Because otherwise not, you work the family to death, you know. All the family had to go to the field. And uh, just like when you were shaking hay to dry it, to cure it, uh, it took up till the mid-1800s when you had this tether here done. You mother, daughters, boys and girls, everybody went to the field to work. They had to do it. And then, of course, while they were down there doing that, there was things in the house that weren't being done, whether you're talking about carding wool or spinning, which you had to prepare so you could weave, so you could have warm clothes tomorrow. Well, that came to a halt because it required all that labor. And then they came along with this machine here, this is what we call a tether, and uh, with a horse pulling it, and, and it would uh, shook, the, shook the hay up. And, and an old man like me at 75 years old with a poor heart, I could take that old horse and get out there, and I was now worth something on the farm because normally I I would be, you know, falling back behind because it was labor. And I could take the horse and replace the whole family. And I could go out there probably in an hour and a half, two hours in a field and do everything the whole family used to try to do. It was a scary thing because, you know, I think that amongst every, every farmer in which the town was full of them, when this new machinery come in, there was those who wanted to try it, couldn't afford it. And there was those who looked at it, suspicion, said it'd never last, like when the car replaced the horse. People that drove horses liked horses, it'll never work, but the car is here and the horse is gone. And uh, they really did, a lot of this was locally made, and of course something like this was a great improvement, as I say. One, one old man, one old horse, and do a work in an hour, an hour and a half, two hours that the whole family would spend all day doing, it, and it was done. And so, therefore, by being, a machine like this and kicking your hay up so it could dry, uh, you took advantage of the height of the sun at two in the afternoon, whereas the family could be shaking hay, and hay till three and four, the best you could do, but it's still, now you lost your sun, you lost your heat, and you're curing. Now the more machine, we went from the scythe, which was used in Bible times, and because that's where a man would, in good shape, could cut one acre of hay in a day. And I'm sure they didn't do that very often. You brought all your neighbors in to help 
as we've done here. And then 1828 over in England was a breakover date when they invented the reciprocal moor. Now this was pulled by horses and they turned around and they had a bunch of honest people witness this moor machine cut 14 acres in one day, 14 acres. Now, I mean, that would be, if you had 14 good men, you might do it, but probably 14 good men couldn't last all day either, you know, because you had, you had to do other chores. And so this, there was such an excitement when they came up with that more, more that would do that. Uh, the men that cut with hand size for a living got pretty shook up over it, and they were going to burn the factory. They were going to stop that because they could see they were going to be replaced. And, now, around uh, 1850, up here in Worcester, we have a Worcester, Boston Worcester Moor out over to my house, and uh, we have a Boston Worcester downstairs, 1864. And so you, you had production of more machines in the 1850s, 1860s, and 1870s up in Worcester. So that was a big, uh, big improvement. And these more machines were getting out to the farms. But the first farm that we have record of that bought a more machine would be old Kyron Stockwell, and he was, he was a tight old Yankee as they came, you know, and, uh, but he was progressive, and he made money, and he saved money, and Kyron had this one wheel pulled by oxen with a four-foot bar, and now you can see he could cut an acre of hay in about an hour's time if his oxen were up in shape, and that was a great thing, but now that took money. Now, Kyron had money to invest. He was a progressive, and there was others that might have been progressive, but they didn't have two pennies to rub together. And so it stopped some, but eventually everybody had a moor. When I was a kid, I mean, that's the way the farm went. You had, you had the moor machines with the fours and five foot bars, and you really went to work with your horses. Hot days, the horse would go out. If it was in this time of year, like we're in August, uh, you would have to be high temperatures. So you went out, you hitched up your horses at four in the morning, and you work them till seven, and then you put them away for the day because they can, can't stand the heat. Uh, I mean, they, they run up to 104, 105 degrees of temperature, body temperature, which is a little hot, and you have to watch them how hard they're puffing and blowing because you could injure them. So as I say, you get up in the morning, you went out in the field, you mowed till seven, and then you put them away, and then you'd work them in the afternoon again. But that was a transition from the hand side, which is from Bible time until 1800s. And that's a eight, over 1800 years of swinging a scythe now to a industrial change where you had a, a you know, modern mower machine that would do it much faster. <laughs> Well, it's a little easier to make a mold than to plow. Plow is a, a, a fairly complicated trick, and it isn't every horse that can do it, you know. Mowing horses can be a little more spirited, and you're sitting down and you're running a lot of controls. It's not, it's not as hard as plowing, you know. But that was probably the first thing that changed the tractor, is mowing. It was hot weather, it was arduous and long, and it really took it out of him. I know that I'm taking this from my father, who told me they had a a farm all regular to use first, and it like revolutionized the mowing. But us guys that like mowers, horse mowers, well, we still have them, you know? You have to be very careful with a mower because it'll clog. They're, they're not like a tractor. Uh, most of the mowing with the horses, it had to be kind of already, you had to be kind of, in some ways they said, in a dead run to get it to mow, to make it go, but it was so much better than the size, it didn't make any difference. If it's uh, I'd make sure the edges are very clear so there isn't anything to clog it up and give it a try. Our blade is pretty sharp and it's got new fingers, so it should work, but if it was uh, 3 o'clock in the afternoon the sun's out bright, <laughs> I'd like it a lot better, you know, could guarantee it. And hay is pretty thick today. It isn't, it were, in the days when these were made, uh, the hay was quite a bit lighter. The better, better feed, you know, there's uh, more nutrients on it. They fertilize it, they seed it, and uh, they get a lot more out of a field today than they did even 25 years ago, you know, uh, it was quite thin. In the old days, they didn't, uh, uh, they didn't mow hay till after 4th of July because it had already passed its food value, but it was getting brown, but it was easy to mow, and they could cure it. Today, they can mow it before 4th of July, way before it, and, and they've got a lot of nutrients and food value in it, you know. So these things were set for the old time, but we kind of mix it up and make them a little better. 
horses like this that are draft horses that are they kind of come to it if, if you're gentle with them and they're a gentle horse some horses won't come to it at all you know they're always fired up and they're always having to hold on them but if uh it would be easier to get them to mold than it would be to plow you know uh because of the rocks and to go very slow and to steady the whole idea of plowing is so you doesn't don't break anything and if it sticks to make them stop but with a mower well if it sticks it'll just jump 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 a little bit and you stop and you get off and clean it off well my cousin right alongside of me will usually bring a fork out if i talk to him nice you know? one of the interesting aspects of dealing with changing technology is that you don't simply have to get rid of that old skill or outdated equipment you simply found ways to make use of that skill. Because remember, new technologies didn't always solve your problems. For example, you didn't want your mowing machine to get too close to your stone wall. And yet, there was still plenty of real good crop growing along that wall. So you brought in some old technology, the scythe. Back in those days, every bit of grass was needed to feed our animals in the wintertime. Now, as you heard right there, oh, you're so many. Dan got Dan got a little Dan got a little close to the wall and nicked his scythe, which we don't want to do. We start we come down the motion like this, and it's all in your wrist. Now you want to have a different angle on this side. Your stone is going to be facing at a different angle. When you come on the back side, it's going to be like this. So it's a motion in your wrist that you have to get used to. And if you notice, right here on my scythe, I carry my stone so close that you can see worn portions right here. Also, you can see worn portions here. I try to hold it as close as I can to the, to the back side of that blade. Usually four or five, half a dozen times, it'll, it'll sharpen it. Also, generally, hand mowing was done when the dew was on the grass because it cut so much easier. The dew and the wetness of the grass acts as a lubricant and it, it mows so much better. As the day goes on, the sun gets higher, it gets dry, and it cuts so much harder. Again, what we do, we use just short strokes and watch for stones or different obstacles along the wall. As I say, we don't want to get too close so we don't hit stones. We leave a little bit of feed there when we tether out the animals so they have a little something to eat. And boys, I'll tell you, they'll clear this area up like nobody's business. And they get fat on it also, and they love it. After this short break, we'll be right back with more about hay and time on a New England farm. Wildlife rabies has reached Massachusetts, and raccoons are the primary carriers. Protect your family and pets from this deadly disease. Do not attract raccoons or other wild animals to your yard. Secure rubbish can lids. Feed pets indoors and vaccinate them yearly. Cap chimneys and seal openings to outbuildings. Do not feed or handle wild animals. Help prevent the spread of rabies. Enjoy Massachusetts wildlife from a safe distance. For information, write Rabies, Massachusetts Division of Fisheries and Wildlife, Westboro, Massachusetts, 01581.
kid always got the job on the hoss, and I can remember the hoss was sweaty, huh? and you sit your can on a sweaty hoss, and that gets itchy, it's salty, wet. So then what do you have for blankets? You didn't have saddles. You take an old burlap, and the burlap was like, you know, you can breathe through it. I mean, that would soak up. And if you tried to walk with the hoss, uh, you ended up with a problem, probably get your feet stepped on, because the, he's kind of violent. When he gets a draft, and he's, he better be steady, and uh, I mean, because he'll, he may step to the left or the right, and your feet don't want to be there. Nothing like Ladies Home Journal or things like that. Farm Magazine, New England Homestead, that was the one that we had. Matter of fact, my mother wrote an article one time and sent it in to the New England homestead. My father used to bring home like a whole quarter of a animal, a beef, you know, and my mother would have to cut it up and to make it into roasts. Uh, we ground up Hamburg and she'd make it into patties. And we used to con our own beef, you know, make corned beef, put, put that down. and. Uh, she, so she wrote an article about that, but she signed her maiden name. So my father came out one day, well, listen, Grace, he said, listen to this story. So he read the whole story to her, <laughs> how, to, how to do it. And she never let on that it was hers or anything. <laughs> so. Well, until the load is done, until you got the load off. That was when you took your break. Oh, there wasn't any break then because you had to had to sweep up what fell on the floor and get that back up on the shelf and put it back yourself. Oh no, there was there was there wasn't any break unless it rained and poured or something like that. Right, Ruth? Right. <laughs> yeah. No breaks. No breaks on the farm. We used to uh, say that my father started haying the week before school let out, and he quit haying September a week or two after school let out so that he could get full use of his sons. You know, one thing I've learned about hanging around farmers here at Waters Farm is the fact they're really problem solvers. Something breaks, they fix it. And they're pretty creative about their approaches to fixing things, too. Because you've got to remember, when we look at the over a century and a half of farm equipment in use here, you've got to remember that if it does break, the only person here is going to fix it is those farmers, their family, and members of the farming community here in Sutton and other parts of New England. So I'll tell you what, as we take a look at this farming equipment in action, Denny, why don't you give me a little more uh, spin here. Just remember about who's got to fix these things, sharpen it up so they do the job they're supposed to. Good job, Denny. Way to go. As has been said, it was part of being born into a period. And you, you helped your neighbor. And uh, I, I can remember my, my story, because cranking the grindstone as a 10-year-old I used to get sick to death of cranking and cranking and cranking. It's not a, doesn't show much progress, but you had to do it, but you got the knife shop and then you did get productive with it. And I was one morning, I was cranking away and I swear I must have been going an hour and a half, but it could have been only an hour, but it seemed like a long time, you know, when you're 10 years old. And I looked up the road and we just got through doing three sections for the hoss mower and a couple of scythe blades and, uh, I saw this Wally Putnam come. Wally's job was to mow around in the cemetery around the stones with a, they didn't have lawnmowers going then. I mean, they had them, but not in the cemetery. That wasn't used. And you cut the tall grass. And Wally's coming down with a scythe over his shoulder and a couple of blades under his arm. And I knew what was going to happen because I'm the only, only kid on the block. And, and I said to my uncle, oh, here comes Wally Putnam. And, and I said, I don't want to really crank this. Oh, Charlie says, you wouldn't mind helping Wally. He needs some help, you know. And of course, he melted me down, you know. And so Wally came along, and I'm back to the grinding. And we did Wally's size, and then he went happily off to Onsby Cemetery or down that road somewhere to cut his hay. And but as I say, you did. You, you were born to it. You were trained to it. You didn't. Maybe it wasn't natural. I didn't want to do it, but my uncle softened me up and you learn from that.
wouldn't consider Waters Farm a unique farm on the American agricultural landscape, but rather a farm that was a great example of the diversity you would find on a New England farm. For example, they would quarry stone out of some of the hills in their property. Apples were a huge part of the legacy of the Waters Farm family. And also, they had a blacksmith shop right here on the farm property. Now, how was a blacksmith shop utilized? Well, to find out, we're going to meet with Fran Donnelly of the Waters Farm Preservation for all those details. So, Fran, uh, yes. blacksmith shop on a farm, was that unusual or was that common? No, it was fairly common because they needed to uh, repair their own equipment. They needed it for the household goods, etc. cetera. Uh, in a house, they were basically cooking in a fireplace. In that event, you'd have uh, cooking implements like trivets, chain, hooks, uh, things to hang things off the uh, fireplace crane with to cook over the open fire, pokers to move coals around under pots and keep them going. Then out in the farm itself, we have some things over here. We could use a, uh, have a clevis pin to hold a pole onto a wagon. This is also goes on the other single tree to hold the chains to pull, draw the horses. And then some inside the house. We have some scissors, which are very nicely made, except for this clumsy pin, perhaps. But this would be used to cut clothing to make clothing with. These are some tin snips made by a blacksmith who worked. So it was very necessary because you saved a great deal of time. If the uh, horse walks at about four miles an hour, and town's four miles away, that means an hour down to town, and then waiting on the blacksmith, getting the work done, then back home. So you might lose four, five, six hours, or maybe a whole day going to the blacksmith shop just to get some work done that you could do at home if you had it. I think even up through the 50s, Sears and Roebuck sold all kinds of forging equipment for farms at a fairly cheap price, so many had them. This anvil here came from a farm uh, in Sutton off uh, Central Turnpike. Friend, being having this blacksmith equipment uh, on the farm, was it someone who they hired to do it, or was someone from the family who actually was a blacksmith? No, normally somebody from the family had some blacksmithing experience, and they would Shoe horses, they generally started out by you through shoeing the horses or shoeing oxen. And then as demands grew, their skill grew. And what had to be done, they learned how to do and it was done. There were people who are itinerants, as you well know, who did travel around. And there may have been some people who did what was called whitesmith work, which would be kitchen utensils primarily. But he wouldn't have too much equipment and uh, he'd maybe make a day's stay to make some spatulas and spoons and things of that nature to use in the kitchen. But that was about it. Primarily a family member. So it was probably likely that the farmer's wife would get up in the morning and leave the farmer a list of things that he needed, that she needed from him from the blacksmith shop. Another honeydew day, yes. Yes, a honeydew day. How do you do this? More than likely. And of course, there were, uh, there were emergencies where if you were plowing and your point was bent, then you could stop, bring it over to the blacksmith shop, take the point off, reforge it, put it back on, and go back to work and not lose a heck of a lot of time. Well, there were a lot of things going on here. You had uh, quarry work going on. You had a cider mill going on. So there was a lot of equipment that had to be taken care of. Points would have to be uh, tempered and rehardened to work in the quarry. You'd have to, uh, no doubt, fix some of the gears, et cetera, in the cider mill. So there was probably much more work for blacksmith on a farm like this than it would be just on a crop farm or a dairy farm. Well, the purpose of caulking hay served first due to the fact that it would shed moisture, and then when the, uh, if you couldn't pick it up that very day and you had to leave it till tomorrow morning, you could take your fork and draw out the hay so it would actually shed water if you got a little light shower. And secondly, when you went to load, you always went between your hay cocks and you'd stick your pitchfork into them and you'd come up with a nice big load and you placed it on the load according to the man who was loading where he told you, this corner, that corner, or mid, mid wagon, and, uh, and then he would put it into position where, he, so you helped him a lot with the haycock, because I mean, of course, you've got a good flock full. When you put it up and you placed it according to where you were directed, you just didn't throw it on anywhere, and you built a load, and you built a square load, and, uh, and it looks good, and it rides good, and then the uh, straw interlocks, and that, uh, the haycock was, and it was usually cleaner when you got through. Very little was on the ground. If it was done up, they put the right size. And uh, when you picked it up, it, there'd be a few scatterings, as they call them, and you'd rake them together and probably throw them into the next haycock and load that one and proceed through the field. When the hand season was on particularly, Aunt Nellie 
was, uh, uh, she's a great lady. I mean, she had two women boarders in there to help put her daughter through college. She had uh, the hired man, and uh, Joe Vaita Leverage was one of them. They were characters, you know. You got $25 a month in room and board. She had her two ladies to serve and feed upstairs as she was boarding. She had the hired man. She had me. She had her husband. She had at least two to, two to three field hands. And it was and that's what she had for burden to put on the food for. Oh, that's perfect. You know, no complaint. This next uh, body came along. You sat down. They, you know, and she could seem to pull magic out of the pantry. It was everything from cheese to bread, pies, cake, and jars of fruit, you know. And so you ate something, you know. And old Brigham, and he'd come out in this model T pulls under the eyes, you know, and wear hands. And he, he greets my uncle and everybody else, and, and then doesn't say a word. He walks into your barn, checks all your pitch box, and he just scrutinizes the handle to make sure it's it's nice and straight. And he didn't think it was met the standards. He gave you a brand new one, and he stayed for dinner. I mean, that was just the way it was. And then and he'd help pitch hay for if he came in the morning, he'd have noon noon dinner with you, and then he was gone to some other farm. That was his amusement. And so, feeding time was a was a big time. And then of course, what you fed up in the morning, you ate at noontime or you ate at supper time. You went through, if you had apple pie left over from supper, you might have that for breakfast. The Civil War brought significant yet subtle changes to the agricultural regions here in Blackstone Valley. The development of mechanical mowers had begun as early as 1833, yet by 1847, in our neighboring county of Norfolk, not one farmer in ten used a mechanical mower. They were generally crudely designed and costly, and the farmers tended to stick with what they knew would work and what they could afford. However, as the Civil War siphoned off the young men of New England, productivity needs required farmers to take a much closer look at mechanized power. The early horse rake was a first great change from hand raking was the 1830s, a flat dump rake and uh, made 99% wood. It worked wonderful till it hit a New England stone and then that shattered them. And then I suppose old Parr or whoever was driving it did some muttering and then you call for the women again and call for the family and back out to the field because you had to break the hay. And when Charles Allen came along, they had a wheeled, well, they call it a Yankee horse rake with steel tines. And the steel tines, if you hooked a stone, they usually slid one side of the stone or danced over the top of them, but they didn't break. Now, a kid like Danny's size, 10 years old, he couldn't hardly reach the pedals, but he went on to that rake. So now you, now you put the kid doing a man's job. This one child with a good horse and an old Yankee horse rake, he could go out there and do the work of the whole family in raking. I mean, he's just a wonderful thing. So that was an improvement there. And don't you think mother and daughters and everybody else didn't appreciate it? But he went out there and he, he ran and worked in the sun and the heat and did the raking. But I'll tell you what, riding a, 
a hot rake on a hot day, you want to have a shirt that doesn't have any holes in it because you'll be burnt to death in the sun. You had to have a Yankee rake. Them darn cussed metal, all metal rakes, they made noise, they scared horses and soured the world. And this Yankee rake was made up in Barry. Uh, it was a wonderful rake. It was. It was a nice one. It was, it was uh, quite quiet and much different. And then you, when you raked your field, as, as he said, you, you start your windrows, and it was a knot. And you learned as a boy, because you got a field that might be, you know, might be 300 feet across or 200 feet, it's basically an acre. And, uh, and you want to see how close you can trip it each time so the windrow is nice and straight, you know? I was fortunate. I never fell off the rake. I never had the horse run away with me. Uh, I guess I had a good, probably a better horse or something or other. Uh, maybe better racing conditions. But anyway, when my brother got on, uh, he, he became, he had the Yankee rake. And I think the Yankee rake was possibly, uh, he had a wooden floorboard across the front there. And I think it was more slippery. And I think he became inattentive <laughs> and he slipped and fell and he went down and he got raked up. And he rolled along with the hay, you know, and uh, the horse just kept right on going. and. Uh, uh, he yelling and yelling, and uh, finally the 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 rake when it got enough hay and uh, load in it, it would it would more or less trip itself because the uh, thing would hit a bump and the dog would catch in and dump him out. Now that transition from horses to tractors that must have been some kind of a challenge for his farm. You could see the advantage of a tractor because you could, as long as you kept oil in it and fuel in it, this machine just cranked out work and didn't cry for a rest. It killed the man before it killed, the, it killed itself. And Fordson Tractor was one of the first ones I saw in Sutton. And in fact, there was one sold over what is presently the Whittier Farms in 1921. And uh, I remember that tractor. I remember seeing it in the 1940s. And I said to my uncle Charlie, because he was a horseman, he bought and sold horses. And uh, I said, why don't you get a tractor? He said, I tried one and didn't like it. I said, oh. I said, what was the matter with Uncle Charlie? Well, he said, you know, the horse has kind of got a soul. And he said, and you start to relate with your horse, you have a, a relationship. And he said, it's a lot different. And he said, a tractor don't have no soul. It's a piece of iron. And he never had a tractor. And of course, when, after he passed through, uh, we used to exchange some of our horse work with a neighbor. And we had a neighbor that was trying to haul out manure and he had probably three and a half feet of water under his barn, and he couldn't get his tractor in there without getting it stuck. So we could back in with a few more horses. At the same time, he took his tractor, and Alice Chalmers, I remember that, and he came up and he mowed for us one time, and I mean, just, just never stopped. And so we saw that, but the old timers, a lot of them didn't, didn't want to get into the tractors. They, they were losing a piece of their life, you know, with their horses. Their horses were their world, you know. One of the things after a rain like you have here, it's very difficult to cut. You like to have it dry out just a bit because the drier it gets, the easier it cuts. And not only that, a lot of times when it rains, it lodges. And when it lodges, it's very difficult to cut. So you kind of wait for the Mother Nature to bring that thing back up again, dry it out, and then you can go back and cut. All farmers depend on Mother Nature. What the good Lord sends you is what you have to work with. We grew up just in the era when we had horses going to tractors. And of course, made things so much easier. And I believe this is uh, one of the reasons why a lot of farmers did it, was because it certainly was easier and it was quicker. Uh, if you have to sigh, you know how long it takes to sigh. Uh, you can see how quickly you can do something with a mowing machine. Uh, and then even with today's technology, uh, your hay binds and so forth, it's again that much quicker again. But it becomes a whole lot more expensive too. Yeah, we miss the old horses, but uh, that's uh, part of the era that, uh, one thing about something like this in December, you don't have to feed it. No horse, you do.
careful. You have to love horses, which we did. We loved horses. And when these 12-foot wagon beds came in, uh, he was put on a good load, and the man on the load, he had to know how to load. That was his job. It was a skill, and the boys had to know how to tramp hay because they got tired. I mean, you pick up your, your legs and get your knees under your chin and push down, and the hay keeps sinking. And after a while, it's kind of a tiresome thing. But uh, as I say, and a man took pride in his load. I mean, a man who could build a good square load was known all over town. And it was important because when you build your load properly, you interlock your, your hay strands, and no, no, when you go over the rough bumps and bones that are coming out of a field or down the road, it helped lock the load in. It didn't fall off, but if you didn't load it right and you got some angles inside, then you start to build on them, and it's going to be like a landslide, like, like snow. It's going to take off, and you find your load on the ground, then it's a, hours to get it picked back up, reloaded, and I've been through that too. An advantage if it had one on each side. So you drove between the haycocks and one pitch from one side and one on the other. And if you got four pitching up, that was a little heavy. That, I mean, a guy could hardly take it, take it and handle that much of production, but he needed two good men. Really worked out good. And mother and daughters, again, they, they hit the fields. Uh, our early life is, uh, is to understand before we started to develop equipment in the 1800s that the whole family was a working team to survive even. You'd go drive inside with your team, and then, and then you'd have two or three guys scrambling up on the hayloft, and I think that was where the, see, Don keyed in on that was hot, and that's when there's no air, and that's when, did the barn have a cupola on it to vent it? And you might have one on it, but where the window's open. See, you, sometimes you go up there, it's full of uh, pigeons, manure, bird nests, and particular bees. So you say, to heck with it, because you're only going to be in the barn to unload the wagon. But the temperature could rise in a barn over 100 and some degrees up in that hayloft. And then you, you took and you put the hay flock on. They were good sized horses. They weren't like the big Belgian horses, but. They were high-spirited horses. That's the way I always figured they were. I remember one time we put a big load on and the horse couldn't pull it and it reared up. My mother standing up on the porch screaming her head off, take that child off that horse. But they never took me off, I had to. <laughs> this is just a story, but John Gifford was a teacher up to North High School, agricultural teacher, nice old guy. And uh, he had a hired man there, and he was right on Boston Road at Devonshire Farm. And that was the end of Devonshire Farm about that time. That's when John kind of ended all things. And he used to have a Chevy, Chevrolet car, and of course, a little bit deaf, and the hired man was on the load of hay in the barn, Mr. Everts. Remember him? And the old man Everts is up there, and he's on the hay flock, and John is down there with his Chevrolet car and he had to pull clean across Boston Road, and the only thing that stopped him was a ledge on the other side. And he'd wind that engine up where he could hear it, see? And then he'd pop his clutch. And this, this one day, poor Mr. Everts is up there, and uh, right on the hay flock rope, and boy, John let pop the clutch and took out across Boston Road. And of course, when he took off with such violence, the, the grapple flock went up against the carriage, and then that would trip, and then the carriage would carry the load down the end of the barn. Instead of this, it went up with such violence, it jumped twice and it knocked Mr. Everts over, broke his arm. He ripped the carriage and the track right out of the Don barn. In 74, she gave it to the town. She deeded it to the town. But before the deeding, she said, it's a little thing, and she looked up at me and she said, now what will you do with this if I give it to you? I said, how do I know? But, I said, you've got 120, 30 acres of land, almost 2,000 foot of water frontage. You have a 1757 house. You have the contents, most of the original contents. And I said, this belongs to the community. I really could feel that. And it belongs to the community, and that's what it's all about. Father's plan.
time as a home rule. Now, there seems to be something about a Robert Frost poem that really captures the very spirit and nature of a New England farmer. The one in particular I'm thinking about goes like this. When a friend calls to me from the road and slows his horse to a meaning walk, I don't stand still and look around on all the hills I haven't hoed and shout from where I am, what is it? No, not as there's time to talk. I thrust my hoe into the mellow ground, blade end up and five feet tall, and plod. I go up to the stone wall for a friendly visit. Well, this has been Ranger Chuck Arning from National Park Service here to John H. Chafee, Blackstone River Valley National Heritage Corridor. And one of the more remarkable things about New England farms and all the folks who came here to demonstrate their skills and knowledge and expertise of the American agricultural scene, and it was done with pitchfork and scythe, oxen teams, horse teams, or new modern tractors. What impresses me the most is the fact that these people came together as part of a sense of community. They came here to this site, this nonprofit, volunteer-driven site, Waters Farm, to show us what they know. And as we watch over a century and a half of agricultural equipment in action, it brings to mind that Robert Frost poem, that these folks just came here for a good, friendly visit. But these farmers are also doers. They're fixers. They're here to fix things. Far uh, farm equipment does break. And as they mend that, they're also mending a hole in our memory as they show us the way of the way life used to be, as they lived and worked here in New England. And they also struggled. And they struggled with the changing technological world, just as we do today. The difference is, though, they have found a way to use their sense of community to help them in that struggle. And there's no better place to find that sense of farm community than here at Waters Farm. So until next time, hope to see you in the Blackstone Valley.